So let's talk about domain. What is the domain of the solution? So what x's work for, and this solution being number two right here, our second one that we tried. I don't care about the first domain, because that wasn't a solution, so we're not going to worry about the domain of that. What's the domain of this right here? So yeah, you can't take natural log of zero or negative. So x goes from open zero to infinity. So some equations have different solutions, and each solution generally has its own domain. So you can't just say, hey, the domain of this of all solutions are going to be this thing. So each solution may have slightly different domains. What's that? Why do we not include the zero? Uh, because ln zero is undefined. If it was a different function, it would have a different uh, its own domain. Where's our original? Right up here. All right. Was this equation that we just uh, checked? We didn't really solve it, but we checked that the solution worked. Is this an implicit function? So let's go look at implicit function definition and decide implicit or not implicit. Oh. All right. Is a function of the form, was our function of this form right here, f of x, y equals 0? No, it didn't equal zero. No. So let's go make it an implicit function. So we're going to put it in this form where the function equals zero. So we're going to solve for zero. It's not algebraically difficult. So I'm going to solve for zero, and we're going to do that down below. So we're going to make x squared y double prime plus 2xy prime plus y equal ln x plus 3x plus 1 make this an an implicit function. So we're going to do that by solving for 0. So let's subtract everything. I'll just choose to subtract everything from the right side, and we'll get 0 on the right. I could subtract everything on the left side to get 0 on the left. It doesn't matter. So we have minus ln x minus 3x minus 1 equals 0. So on, in one sense, we could say the variables are x and y, except there's also not just y, but there's a y prime, and in this one, there's a y double prime. So we could say there's really just two variables, but I'll write them all down. Variables, we definitely have x. We do have y, but let's write y as f of x. We have a y prime, which is f prime of x, and y double prime, which is f double prime of x. Oh, that's not good. Can't use f so many times. The implicit function cannot be named f if I used f for the one of the inputs, basically. 
So we'll go implicit function. Let's call it g. So it'll be g of. We got x, f of x, f prime of x, and f double prime of x. And this function is the one we just wrote down. x squared. You could write it in y's or f's. It doesn't matter. X f prime plus f minus ln x. minus 3x minus 1 equals 0. All right, now we have written it as an implicit function of these variables. So there is the implicit function. So when f of x is the solution, That means it equals 0 for all x in the domain of little f. So that's what it means to be a solution to this implicit function. When you plug in this particular f, you get that it equals 0 for not every single x, but every x that's valid for the uh, little f function that we've found. So what x values did I not have to worry about for our particular example? 0 and all the negative ones. They didn't have to make this equal 0. They didn't have to satisfy this equation. Only the ones that were valid for little f. Yes, yeah. So upside down a means all. So we're going to show this implicit function is a solution to this other implicit function. So we're going to do this very carefully. There's a few ways to do it. When in doubt, what's a good thing to do to, to begin? Take derivative. Oh, very good. Take derivative. Of what with respect to which variable? We got two equations. <laughs> so just looking at this, I see right here, at some point I need to find y prime. So I can plug it in here. I'm trying to solve, trying to show that this little f is a solution to g right here. So at some point I need to find y prime so I can plug it in. So what we're going to do is focus on this right here. And we're going to see, can we figure out what is y prime? What do we do to this? So we take a derivative. All I see is y prime. y prime equals the derivative of y with respect to which variable? Don't think too hard. X. X. 
So when we see y prime, we're taking an x derivative. So what we're going to do is take a ddx derivative of this right here. Implicit derivative, and then you're solving for y prime at the end. So this is what we did in Calc 1. Very carefully take an implicit derivative and solve for y prime. So I'll give you a minute to figure out y prime. If you forgot how to do this, talk to one of your neighbors. Maybe they remembered. If not, shame them. <laughs> So I multiplied by 30, get rid of all the 3's, and then I just factored our y prime out, and then subtracted x squared, added y, and then divided. So any questions on getting y prime? Uh, what's that? Third. Well, I multiplied both sides by 1 third. So zero times a third is still zero. I just did that to knock out all the threes, basically. All right, so we got y prime. We're halfway there. Now we're going to very carefully plug in y prime into the original and see what we get. So this y prime is what's going to be dropped in for y prime. So I could write <coughs> g of x, y, y prime. I could write it as g of x comma y comma y minus x squared over y squared minus x. So my y prime is this ugly expression right here. And now I'm going to carefully, everywhere I see y prime, I'm going to write that in its place. And hopefully this will add up to zero. So we have y squared minus x, y prime. Minus y plus x squared. So y squared minus x cancels y squared minus x. x squared minus x squared, y minus y. Oh, look at that. We get 0. So it took a while to get there, but we did get there. So all you do is very carefully figure out what is y prime. Luckily, I didn't have to get y double prime. That would have been a lot less fun. Uh, it would have been less fun because y double prime would have y primes hanging out in it as well, it looks like because of your chain rule. So, so you don't have to do sub back into y prime so you don't get to that. Well, so 
I could do, I'll do this in blue because it's not relevant for this problem, but it's something you may have to do in the future. If I needed to get y double prime, there's, I do need to take another ddx derivative, but the question is of which equation? You could certainly do it on the last equation right here. The good news then is you would have y double prime on the left. The bad news is on the right side, the first thing you have to do is a quotient rule. And then you have uh, some ch power rule, chain rule happening inside of each of those. And you get extra y primes hanging around. So y double prime, no matter what's going to have y prime in it as well. Um, and it will be most likely more complicated. So I could get y double prime by taking another derivative. That is the end of chapter four. Oh no. End of chapter three. Now we're going to chapter four. General solution of a differential equation. Here's the differential equation you solved in most of calculus two. Well, about half of calculus two is antiderivatives. And here's one way to see an antiderivative written as differential equation. Y prime equals f of x, solve for y. So how do you solve for y? Integrate both sides, that's how you knock out a prime. So how do you under differentiate? You take an antiderivative. So you're going to solve by y equals antiderivative fx dx. That was our basic solution for almost every problem. Now it's easy to write that down. It's much harder to actually compute antiderivatives that are complicated. It's very easy to write down, oh yeah, it's just the antiderivative. So that was cal most of Calc 2. There are sequence in the series and some other things we did, but that was most of what we did was solving this. Well, a little more detail. dy over dx equals f of x, and you multiply, you separate it out, move the dx over, and then you integrate both sides. And that's how you get y equals the integral of fx dx. So that's all the intermediate steps right there. Yeah. We keep hearing, like, yeah, you know, well, curves aren't supposed to work like this, but then you can do that and integrate it. How did that come about to realize you could just separate them like that? Because I keep hearing people, like, uh, say, you know, don't really think it should work like that, but please. Well, I don't want to comment on how other people think things should or shouldn't work. Okay. I'm not an expert on the history of where exactly it came from. So I'm going to direct you to the internet for. Um, how the notation was used as derivative operator versus an algebraic like separation of them. And of course, any antiderivative we take, there's a plus constant that's in there. And that's for any time we take an antiderivative. So when I worked last night, didn't want that constant in there. Oh. The Did they give you any initial conditions? Or were they asking? It basically, it was, it was number two that I was referring to. It didn't want C1 or the plus or minus T. They just wanted the two sine T, X equals two sine T. Oh. Was there initial conditions on there? Like it passes through a point or? I don't think so. OK. I'll look at that. Number two? Because I was expecting to write this nice answer, but for the first step. Yeah. 
and whatnot in there, but for that one, well, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, So there are infinite solutions to your antiderivative, one for each real number, constant real number, basically. So now we're going to solve. by finding all solutions. So in Calc 1, we solved y prime equals f of x. Now we're in differential equations, and I'm giving you y triple prime equals some function. So what do you think we're going to do? Take an antiderivative. Take an antiderivative, and then we're going to take another antiderivative, and then finally another antiderivative. So we're going to take three separate ones. So I'm going to do something that I don't normally recommend, which is I'm going to mix the two notations together. It's going to look on the next step, though. Let's not mix the notations. Let's just go on to the DDX. All right. So that's certainly Y triple prime. DDX, DDX, DDX. I don't like the way the notation looks with three derivatives. Let's just do this one first. Y prime equals e to the x. Antiderivative of both sides, left side is y, e to the x plus c. All right, so that first one should be really straightforward right there. Now from this. No, that would be um, y prime cubed if I did that. Because the dy dx is, is y prime, and if I did three of those multiplied, that would be um, the, the first derivative cubed instead of the third derivative. So I'm having a real problem.
trying to think of good notation that works. Maybe our first attempt was OK. So I broke out one derivative here. This will be a little unsatisfying, but I think think about it grouped up like this. If I use any other letter other than y double prime, what's the antiderivative of dA? A. So you don't want to think any more than that. The antiderivative of dy double prime is y double prime. It's a little weird to have y double prime as your variable, but if you just go with it, it will work out this way. The notation will work out. So y double prime equals e to the x plus c. So we got rid of one of the primes right there. I think this notation should get us where we want to go. So I'm going to cross out this other stuff. That didn't work out. All right, how do I knock out the next prime? I'm going to do the same thing I did. I'm going to take a prime and write it as GDX instead. So I rewrote it. One of the derivatives, one of the primes written as GDX. And do the same trick we did last time. DY prime equals EX plus C DX. And now we're going to integrate both sides. So it's the same procedure we did last time. So antiderivative dy prime is just y prime. Antiderivative e to the x, e to the x. What is the antiderivative of c? Cx. Cx. And what else do we need to have the proper antiderivative? Constant. Another constant. So we're going to have some constants here. Let's give these some proper names. I'll call the first constant c1. And then we'll have our next constant will be C2. So you're going to find that we have sometimes multiple constants. Unfortunately, our first constant is multiplied by x. So I can't just add the two constants together. If it wasn't for that x, we would just have constant and constant. But we have constant times a variable, which is not constant. All right, last step. You can get rid of the last prime. You saw how to do it. I'll do the first step. Rewriting the left side. So multiply by dx and integrate. And you should get a third constant out as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, skip the step, but didn't skip the notation step on that side, yeah. All right, any questions on this antiderivative here? Should be pretty straightforward. The functions are not bad. All right, this is a general solution right here. You can pick any C1, C2, C3 you want. So this has what we call a three parameter family of solutions, because you can pick any C1, C2, and C3 that you want. 
So we'll write out the solution. is y equals so this function really has there's one what we would consider variable but there's really three other constants that could could be any numbers so the three right here we call this a three parameter Parameter family of solutions. And this is called the general, the general solution. to our original ODE, which was y triple prime equals e to the x. So that's what we call the general solution. So the opposite of a gen, well, the opposite would be non-solution. But a particular solution is when you fix these parameters. You actually pick numbers and put them in for c1, c2, c3. So it's where all your parameters have particular values. So you actually pick three numbers. So how do you get those? And you get those by, these are all based on initial conditions. Initial conditions take many forms. Some of them look like uh, conditions you may be used to. You may have uh, some particular, basically, uh, <coughs> x and y value. The book tends to write them like this, y of x naught equals b naught. And that would be the equivalent of f of x naught equals b naught, which you could write as a point x naught comma B not if you want to write it as x, y. So these all tell you the same information. Just depends on how you want it written out. So the book tends to use the left one here. I like the middle one a lot. And if you're thinking more graphically, you want the one on the right. But they all tell you the same information. So these conditions, you've seen conditions like this plenty of times. These are like regular algebraic uh, relationship. Other conditions may look like y prime of, it may not necessarily be the same x value, and generally won't be the same y value either. So you may have an x and y, or I should say an x and a y prime value. This is the same as f prime of x1 equals b1. I don't really want to write it as a point because it's not really a point on the graph because the, it's not the y coordinate, it's a y prime, which is a slope. So it's not best to think about it on a graph. So I don't want to write, the, write it out as a point. And of course you could have double prime, maybe another one. And of course you can write that, f double prime of x2 equals b2. So these are what initial conditions look like. And there's no reason to stop after two derivatives. 
that you can go as many derivatives in as you want. So the general rule and initial condition may, usually does, may determine one parameter. Now I say may determine one parameter because sometimes you need two or three initial conditions to even get the first value out. So maybe initial condition tells you how C1 and C2 are related, but not necessarily how what exactly C1 or C2 themselves. And generally, the conditions I give you, n conditions will determine n parameters. That's how we'll work. Are they typically given like that, or is it like form, or how do you generate It can be any way. There's not necessarily one way that it will always be. n conditions determine n parameters. So we're expecting, if we want to get all three, we're going to do the same differential equation. If we want to get all three parameters, we need three initial conditions. So our first one will be y of 0 equals 2. Our second one, y of 1 equals e. And our third one, y of 2, will be e squared plus 3. Now these initial conditions don't happen to have derivatives in them. But overall, they definitely could have derivatives in them. All right, take a minute and figure out C1, C2, and C3. So go ahead and plug them in. Remember this first one, because these are basically just x, y values, you could write it as 0, 2, a point, or you could write it as f of 0 equals 2, however you like to write it. And remember our original solution was c 2 over 2 x squared plus c 1 no that's not good uh oh something's not working well <laughs> 